hello everybody. My name is Ryan Miller. I'm the communications manager for the Washington State Department of Ecology's Nuclear Waste Program. We're excited to welcome everybody on both Zoom and Facebook to our next uh, Let's Talk About Hanford conversation, which is themed First Foods. And we're really excited to welcome on tonight uh, One X Red Elk from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Um, so first off, we just wanted to recap that these events, uh, we started these virtual Let's Talk About Hanford events um, back a uh, I think we're about two years ago now is our first event. And we cover different um, Hanford topics or Hanford related topics uh, just to, and we started it um, during the COVID restrictions because we couldn't do in-person outreach and education. Um, and so again, we're really happy to have this event tonight and to welcome all of you and to, to, and to, to have one X on. And I will go ahead and hand it over to Anna Grisel who will go over some housekeeping items and then we'll get right into the swing of things. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is just a reminder that tonight's event is about the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation's first foods. We ask you that please put your questions and any comments that you may have throughout this talk into the chat box on Zoom that is on the right hand side, or just submit a comment on Facebook at any time. As far as the structure of tonight's event, we will first have a presentation presentation by our guest speaker. Then we will follow that by a live question and answer with all of you. After the presentation, we'll just enable cameras and microphones for attendees, and we would love to see you turn on your camera and ask your question live. If you prefer not to do that, you can just put your question in the chat, and we'll make sure to answer that. If you want to ask your question out loud, just put your name in the chat box as I indicated or raise your hand so that we can call your name. For your information, these conversations are geared to be more high level information about Humphrey site and related topics. So tonight obviously is how First Foods relates to the Humphrey site. And we really try to avoid going into the technical weeds. So we encourage questions and comments into the chats at any time, like I already said, but please make sure that you're gearing your questions to tonight's topic. We will do our best to answer your questions, but if we get anything that is not in the topic for tonight or is too complex for this forum, we will defer your questions to a future event where we focus on that specific topic or to a more appropriate avenue. Um, if you would like to send the questions that were not answered tonight to our email, that is hanford at ecy.wa.gov. And we will be happy to follow up with you. Uh, if we aren't able to get to any questions tonight, we commit to following up with you like I already stated. And I think that's all for me. Back to you, Ryan. Awesome. And now we'd like to, to welcome on Wenex Red Elk. Wenex is a public outreach and education specialist for the Confederated Tribe of Umatilla Indian Reservations Department of Natural Resources First Food Restoration Management. And welcome, Wenex. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself and then we can get into the to, to the presentation part of the night. That's Cloud Inam Latiwa Kahim Yuma in Wana Kiksa Wenix Wawukia Alpel. My name is Wenix, which means an equine through a mountain canyon as it rises off the ground. Um, my last name is Rao, and I am the public outreach and education specialist for the Department of Natural Resources for the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Inner Reservation, and I work underneath the Cultural Resource Protection Program. And uh, tonight I'll be doing my best to um, discuss issues related to um, the Tri-Cities area and Hanford area, related more towards um, what we do with First Foods, some of the work we're doing related to the cultural preservation and a little bit about the area. And my strong point really is that the cultural background and the foods. Um, I know a little bit about a technical and I will try to explain a little bit about some of the work that we're doing um, to a point of my ability, to the best of my ability. <laughs> Awesome. Did you want us to share the video now, Winx? Yeah. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to open up with when we talk about our tribe's first foods and the management of our first foods, our Department of Natural Resources has created created a unique mission statement 
to assist us guiding first by utilizing the tribe's cultural practices and cultural teachings and putting it first and foremost because it is the practice that guides what we call our tamanwit or our natural laws. So tribal people or our tribe in general um, and other tribes throughout the plateau and other areas, one of the first things that we're governed by is what is considered an unnatural law or the laws of the land or what we call the unwritten law related to Tamanwa or Tamawa that talks about um, guiding the first foods first. And the we're going to start out with the story of the creation of the foods and how we, and after that, I will let you know how we have implemented it as a management practice to better align the work that we do with with the tribe's culture and with our belief system and also the rules that govern us to help us be better managers with not only managing on the science side, but the cultural side and the, the key components of what um, our tribe is all about and how we're managing to be compliant to our tribal membership, um, the relationship back to the treaty, our reserved rights and how we work that all in together. Amazing. And we'll go ahead and uh, have Dana share the video now. Then creation was complete, man and woman, the yellow of the earth, the red of our blood, the red of our life and the blue of the heavens above, our spirit. We were created in these three, three steps in our belief. But the Creator had already had things on this world that were here prior. So as a man stood on the east side looking to the west, and the woman stood on the west looking to the east, all creation came before them. The first to speak and give of himself. And he spoke for all the life, the water life that followed him was a salmon. As the first food he gave and sacrificed of himself. After salmon, all the water life named of itself. All the salmonoid species, all the resident fish species down to the shako, the clams. The second to speak of the first foods was a deer. The deer gave of himself to be our food. He gave us his bones to become our tools. He gave his skin to become our clothing. And then he also gave to us one of the biggest gifts of his hide to make the drum. After the deer spoke, then all the animals that walked the land named themselves in order in the first foods as they went along. Elk, antelope, moose, buffalo, even down to the groundhog, which is a food as well. And they gave a promise that they can never change. And from the day of the beginning to this day, they're still the same. So then creation turned and looked to the west, and it was the woman who stood. Then all the plant life and roots that we use named themselves to her. And the first to speak was the bitter root. I am Peche, I will be your food. But before anybody harvests, you've got to have that ceremony to recognize that new growth. And that was the law that was made. Then the roots, all in order, named themselves. Many, many, many roots. Luke, Chau, Sasmita, Anipash, Panku, Maman. All kinds of different roots that some of them we don't even harvest now these days ourselves. And then the berries then spoke to the woman. And they named themselves in the order. But the one to speak was the uh, Wilno the huckleberry. And like any good grandmother, wanted to see all of her children go first before her. 
That's why she's always served at the last part, at the end. Then after all the berries named themselves in order that they give themselves, then creation all looked back to the man, to the east. And at that time is when the water spoke. In the Shwanisha truth, I am water. I will be the blood of our mother, the earth. From me, you are born. Both men and women are born from water. The meal is not done until the end when you drink water and pray again. The salmon that went and came back and never changed, never broke that promise. The animals that live in the mountains that can never change, they've never broken that promise. But when European people have come and brought us all the easy things of life, many years ago it was a gun metal, lives, things were easy, made easier. Canvas, homes, cars, airplanes, TV, internet, everything this day that makes our life easier takes us that much farther away from our first foods. We're the ones that have changed and it's up to us now to change ourselves back to reacquaint ourselves with that great law that can never be changed. Chi Iwana Kushna Shtumanachin Nami Outnin Natkwarat Miai. This is a testimony I give in relationship to our first foods, the holy sacred foods. Audyana Kushna Shapawachakaisha Nami Minash in Miai. And I commit this to recording for the future of my children. That perhaps it will never be left behind. Because these are not my words. Because I'm only repeating and echoing the words of my elders. Are you guys all able to see that? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so we really like, prior to our having Thomas do our creation story is we'd always recite that word for word. And we had worked with the group, the Wisdom of the Elders, who was doing some series for us that recorded Thomas. And that really lines up because you have those visuals that talk about the importance of those foods and how they relate to it. And with that creation story is how we work forward to um, manage the resources that are so key and important to us. When we're talking about our first foods, we're talking about um, out need to cut it. That is talking about something that is precious that comes from the beginning of time. When we talk about first foods, it's a loaded concept. It's not just foods. First foods represents all food species groupings from the from the fish to the animals to the roots to the berries to the low root bearing plants all the way to the shrub bearing from the small all the way up to the overstory. So it's a pretty loaded concept when you look at that.
Maya. So what we're going to go over today is just kind of the goals of the presentation is to increase the understanding related to the Umatilla tribe's culture, the first foods order, the relationship that that has for the tribe related to the ecology and the landscape, and particular talking about um, areas in the Tri-Cities area bringing attention to those first foods, the ecological and physical processes of that, that sometimes are unrecognized and de devalued versus how we look at them outside the reservation and providing importance related to that and how we're um, co-managers within the area of the Tri-Cities related to Hanford and why it is so important to us. So in 1855 is when the tribe's treaty was established over in the Walla Walla Valley. During that time, it combined, when you have federations, it means more than one. It combined the Kais, which is the superior people, the Imatillam, which are the Umatilla, and the Wililipu people, which are the Walla Walla, Walla people. During that time of census, there was about 1,500-ish um, during that time, we seeded 6.4 million acres. Um, that was the land base that was um, granted to the United States. And in that, we retained, meaning we reserved the rights we had already had across that landscape. And we also became a sovereign nation, creating the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Um, it was surveyed at about uh, a quarter of a million acres back in 1859. During the Dawes Allotment Act, there was things that happened that diminished some of that land base to about 158,000. And we're working on the restoration of those acres back to 200,000 at the moment. In 1949, our constitution and bylaws were adopted by the tribe to help us govern with our board of trustees, our general counsel, and others that help us kind of lead of how we're running the tribe and um, doing the work of the sovereign nation. So currently our tribal membership is about 3,171 tribal members, give or take. 30% of those are children under the age of 18. 15% are elders over the age of 55. And about half of our people are living either near the reservation are on, and then the rest are scattered throughout the country and also abroad. Their tribe has, um, we do a lot of government to government um, relations, and I'm gonna list a few of the activities and roles that we play. The government to government relationships um, happen at all levels, which are federal, state, tribal, county, city, we do um, also a lot of outreach within the area just to local agencies, public lands, uh, different people all the way down from the schools all the way up. We have the Oregon Legislative Commission on Indian Services. Um, we have been and had active roles in the establishment of the governor's executive order into law. Um, we have done work related to the US Congress um, and Oregon and Washington state legislators. Currently right now, this is that seeded tract, which is the 6.4 million acres. So the tribe has um, rights across this area, which you have in the um, green. When you add the um, reservation, this is kind of the, the boundaries of um, the described reservation boundaries. And the reservation is kind of broke down a little bit further than that, but this kind of shows kind of the gist of that and how it reaches all the way up to the top of Richland and Hanford and all the way down towards Burns and over. We also have usual and custom areas that extend those. So historically, when you looked at the um, land use across the areas, um, our tribe was interacting uh, predominantly in that 6.4 million acres, which is the brown that you see there. Um, that's kind of the density. We travel a lot in those areas, but we weren't also within those areas. 
we traveled all the way down towards California to the coast, up to Canada, all the way over towards Montana, following the Buffalo, all the way down to Wyoming, and into we went all the way down to Utah, actually all the way to Salt Lake City and a little bit beyond in some of those areas too. But when we're looking at that, it's really important because the tribe does have those usual and custom areas, and there's some resources that we cannot get within the area of that 6.4 million acres. So we have to look at how do we increase um, access to some of those areas and why it's important and how that distribution of food chain um, goes across that, that landscape. And how can we continue to get access for tribal membership because we do have treaty rights related to those areas. In the Treaty of 1855 in Article 1, it... Um, states the different exclusive rights that we have. In there is the exclusive right of taking fish in the streams running through the border said reservation. We also have the ability, um, the privileges for hunting, gathering roots, berries, and pasturing, pasturing our livestock and animal on unclaimed lands in common with citizens and then forth. And so that's just kind of that article of kind of what we're able to do. Um, if you want more information, you can look up what that treaty is to read the whole entire thing, but just in just. Um, so when you're looking at this area, Hanford and Tri-City areas, it was a, a travel hub for a lot of different places. Celilo Fall was one of the biggest, but also when you look at the Tri-Cities area, it also was a pretty major travel hub because of where you have the reach and the abundance of fish that was going within that area. And so on this map, it kind of shows the the areas of the different tribes who are coming in and out of the area from not only Celilo that this focus on, but into that region. So tribes follow a seasonal round, which when the seasons start coming, the food returns back to the land, as Thomas was talking about those foods that come first with the salmon. Right now, we are just leaving our spring salmon. We're getting ready to go to the summer run. We have been gathering our roots from February, March, April, May right now. Some of the roots we're still able to gather depending if um, some of the roots that are earlier roots, like the April-ish, the March, if we go up to areas that are around the snow line, we can still follow them up in the upland territories to follow some of those foods so we can access so when you're looking at areas such as Rattlesnake, that's one of the areas that's kind of important because it is so high, it's a little bit colder up there. But in that area, because it is drier, some of the foods turn faster than they would like over here in our area. So the Department of Natural Resources First Foods mission, I just realized I have a typo there, is to protect, restore, and enhance the tribe's first foods, which is chush, which is water, nusuch, salmon, yamash, deer, Chaush, the biscuit root, Wimu, Huckleberry, for the perpetual cultural, economic, and sovereign benefits of the tribe. We accomplish this by utilizing traditional ecological knowledge, just the knowledge of the people first, the knowledge and the culture related to those foods and related to where they are. And then we take science to help us be better informants on that by looking at the population of those resources. And, the habit, and creating habitat management goals and actions to help us manage those resources by looking at what did they look like in the past, historically? How can we work to get to the abundance of those? What goals do we have to put in place and things do we have to fix, which might take a long time, but how can we get there to get it more abundant how it was historically? And that's always the goal for us. And then looking at creating natural resource policies and regulatory mechanisms um, to help protect them, regulate them, and for us to reach those goals. Tribes have always been protecting our resources from time immemorial. We have been restoring, enhancing them from time immemorial as children or whenever I have ever been taught things when we're going out to gather, um, for example, willows for if we're going to do like a um, a Thule longhouse that's going to have multiple frames and we're gathering, um, you have to gather 
willows or rose or wh whatever is within the area, you have to gather those for the ribs around the poles to be able to put the mats. You're told that when you gather, you only take so much of the plant and you cut it in the way so next year, when it grows back, it's going to grow straight and long and it's going to grow better. So when you go back and harvest again, it will be easier and it will be healthier by helping prune it and to bring it along. Also, when you're harvesting uh, traditional foods or roots, you're taught to dig in a specific manner that you don't stay in one place. You dig a little bit and you move across that landscape. As you're moving, you take the tops. As you're digging, you're aerating, you're pulling it up. You put the tops back down in the ground and it reseeds over time. And even when you're looking at how you're hunting and how you're fishing, there's different practices that are taught to you and uh, of the things that you're supposed to follow related to those foods. And if they're not there, you give them time. You give them a rest and a break for them to be able to come back to those areas. That's even if you have to wait 40 or 50 years for that to happen. In some case, such as the camas, we have waited that long. We have only been gathering camas for the last few years. We had to kind of relearn that, that um, practice of how to cook and take care of it just because the resource was not um, at an adequate level for us to be able to harvest um, because it, it wasn't a sustainable resources and it needed some help. So one of the things that we do is looking at how you look at that first food serving order and how we're using it to guide Department of Natural Resources work. So you have the water, the salmon, the deer, the roots, and the berries, salmon representing all the aquatic steer, all the animals, cow shawl, the root bearing, weminos representing all the um, shrub bearing from the low shrub to the overstories. When we look at that, we have aligned our treaty rights. Because we have treaty rights, we have water rights to help us protect that water. And with the water rights, we have that lined up underneath our water resource program that helps manage and takes care of anything related to the water. We have our fisheries program that takes care of all the aquatics from the upper keystone species all the way down to your microorganisms and the habitat related to those. We have our hunting rights, which represents our wildlife program that represents and takes care and protects and does the work for the restoration of those resources from all the animal species, from the, the big species all the way down to even your winged animals and things related to wildlife. And when you look at all the water fish and the um, animal species, those also reside in the how you take care of the habitat related to the waterways. And those foods are represented as those men's foods that within those categories. And then you have the women's food representing into the root bearing and the shrimp bearing that we have our range agriculture and forestry program that protects them. So you have a lowland mix with the upland mix and how we're going to take care of those things. We have a cultural resource protection program that looks at protecting um, all the resources um, that are above ground, below ground, the sites related to them, and what relates to them um, historically, currently, and taking care of that. The First Foods Policy Program to create those policies, our Energy Environmental Science Program, Education Outreach, which I do for all those programs, the Department of Natural Resources, and other task is assigned from the, the tribe or board of trustees or wherever they send me, which is a lot of work sometimes. So when looking at these, when we're looking at those resources, we, we have these lists of what those foods came forth in those creation stories and everything named itself. Um, in the story, you have the key um, high level species that we talk about, but in creation, they say that took days and days to talk because everything named itself. And when they named, they also named the things that they would do for the people and those relationships with that. So you have the salmon, all the species within the timing, Chinook, Coho, Sockeye, Lambre, Smelt, Stillhead, Trout, and the time that they come up and so on your table, you'd be set within those groupings when you did anything related. Whenever we do um, meetings related to our first foods with DNR and they have all the managers within all those programs, it is always set in the order of the first food. So their first topic is water. The second one is fisheries related. The next one is wildlife. 
related, and then so forth. So we make sure that we're compliant, not only in the way we manage, but everything we do related to that. Even if you walked in our building, we have our program set within that order. When we moved into our new building, we wanted to make sure we were following our mission statement and how we led that. And the Board of Trustees actually implemented implemented that in 2006 when Eric proposed it and we started really enforcing that to help guide the work that we do today. And so this is a quick example of what foods will look across a landscape when you look. The white line represents basically the Umatilla watershed and in that watershed you could see how you have the Umatilla River where the blue line, this is the historical areas, and we have reestablished salmon runs in the Umatilla all the way up to the North Fork, where they're um, restoring in some of the lower tributaries, and then the interaction of people with that when the foods are there and available, um, how it spreads across from the Columbia is coming down this way, Washington's on the other side. Um, so when you when you have that there, you have, we start doing everything in the lowlands down in the riverway. And then as the months start coming up into right now, April, May, June, we're up in the um, the upper part of Cabochil in the mountains. We're digging roots now across these landscapes. And the roots aren't only found on the reservation, but they're, some of the roots grow in places two, three, four hours from here. We have some cultural resources that we need for example, such huckleberry baskets. We have to go all the way to Mount Adams. We have to go all the way over to Portland to areas to gather the cedar root for those baskets. So that's why it was important that in the treaty that we have those usual usual and accustomed areas to be able to go access certain things that only live at certain places. And then as the season goes later into the summertime, you're into the huckleberries and then you're oak hunting into the winter time and so we're following the landscape from the bottom of elevation to the floodplains all the way to the uplands so when as managers we have to manage from the bottom of the system all the way up and so when we're looking at first foods they're the center of our culture here's some foods that show kind of things that we do related we for all of our foods we have feasts represented to recognize those foods, to thank those foods as they come back to the landscape um, and the foods that we celebrate and the ceremonies that go with them. So when you're looking at Hanford, it's very, it is a very important place because it is the, in the upper part of that 6.4 million acres. And so our policy that we have, this is a real quick snap of it, um, is which was adopted by the board in 2009, was to protect and restore the Hanford area, was also to look at um, having a clean and safe area for tribal members to eventually be able to go back to use and to be able to go back and gather resources that are healthy there. And there's gonna take time because it has to be cleaned up um, to the point that we can do that one day. And then returning those conditions back to 1855 conditions are, we know that's going to be hard because there is contamination and things that are there. But how are we going to, how is, um, how are they going to clean that up? And so the tribe is not only the Umatilla tribes, but all three tribes, the, the Yakima, the Nez Perce, and you have the Wanapums too that are co-managers within those areas that look at um, their their use within those areas from the Tri-Cities area. We used to get all gather there and have a lot of different celebrations in the fall time. We would come there to gamble. There was village sites all along from the bottom part of the reach um, through the through along the whole that whole Columbia River. They said at one time there were so many um, villages and sites along there that in the nighttime it would be lit up where you could see fires all along that area because there were so many of them. Um, because of the, the richness of the resources from the river. And a lot of our root bearing, like kind of that, that um, uh, what's it called? Um, scrubland area. We have a lot of foods that grow within some of those areas. And so as we're looking at that policy, how we're going to work to to do those type of things. So here's kind of a, you can find, so if you 
look up or go purchase the book. It's called on the Sahaptan place name Atlas of the Cayuse Human Tale in Walla Walla. There's this image that is a better image that kind of shows um, some of the place names kind of roughly of areas that had names and some things that were found in those areas, certain um, certain sites. And so within there, there's this, these are really close. You can't really see what they are. Um, some of these sites were very specific for what was there. You had some areas that on certain side of the rivers that was for um, fishing spring Chinook. You had different village sites that were for where they had the weirs, where they horse race. There were certain areas that were named for um, where they would go hunting for waterfowl or where they would hunt um, rabbits. There was areas that were very specific to certain things. There were even areas in different islands that were meant for grazing. And that's where they would have like different activities where they don't have um, they might have like horse racing there or different events and gatherings. So there's places specific for different things, but there are so many, um, cultural areas along from, tri from Tri-Cities from the very bottom part, all the way up and along that reach area that is very important to us and what is found there. So what, this is an example when you look at the white bluffs. That was um, an area that was um, known to um, all those three tribes. And there was things that were very important for those areas, like the, the white clay. They would use that to, um, in ceremonies, for trading. The Walla Walla people in general, they had a lot of um, village on the upper part. Predominantly uh, of our tribes, Walla Walla really lived in some of these areas in the higher part of that reach area. And one of the things that they were known for is they used to trade a lot for that white, um, for the white clay as other tribes did for their ceremonies and also to clean buckskin and for the things. And so there are certain places that were very key to gather certain resources that belong and live there. So when you're looking at um, the programs that we have that are, are related to the work they do for Hanford issues. And these are pretty high level. Um, a lot of these that I don't know a lot about. Um, I know in our cultural resources, they're, they're doing Hanford work every day. And it can be very grueling on them uh, of the, the topics and the amount of time that they take where they have whole entire weeks that all they're doing is just doing consultation back and forth. We have our first foods policy program, natural resources damage assessments that are done within the area. Um, they have a natural resource trustee council participation that they work in. Our environmental energy and science program, they also have offices over there as does um, cultural resources, you know, does work with, within those areas, but they look at the air quality, um, chemist related to that, ecological, the laboratory that they have over there. They're also growing um, different resources for different sites over there or doing testing on things related to those areas. They have field station, they do analytical laboratory and greenhouses um, that are here, but they also have work that they are, they are doing and sites over there on the Hanford site. Our cultural resource protection program, we're really working to promote, promote protect and the preservation um, of the cultural significant places related to those areas and how we work for that. Um, but Cultural Resources does a lot of work and participates in working groups such as the Hanford Tribal Technical Working Group, Pacific Northwest Site Office, DLE Cultural Issues, Tribal Affairs, National and Hanford State and Tribal Working Groups, the Bonneville Power Administration, Hanford Working Groups, the U.S. Forest Service, Hanford Reach National Monument Working Group, Lalique Public Access Working Group, Intertribal Advisory Boards, Manhattan Product National um, Historical Parks. Some of these boards, um, there is participation from all of the tribes within those to help manage the multiple multitudes of issues that are on the um, Hanford site and looking at how our policies help um, 
do the work they need to do by looking at those natural resources of how they're managed in the area, how the cleanup and operations of the Hanford site is going and, and what the tribe thinks is important, looking at the cleaning of groundwater, water waste management, the long-term term stewardship, risk assessment, transportation, cultural resources, um, and other things related to those topics. And so when you're looking at Hanford, our, our Department of Natural Resources and Tribe has its feet all over the place in there and the importance that is to our land. One of the things I really want to talk about is how that connection to cultural sites and land is very important to us because when we are removed from sites, like we have been Hanford, there are certain areas that there is very special areas related to Hanford, related to different village sites, related to resources that can only be found on that site. When you remove that, you remove the language that they had related to those areas, the place names, the activities that were done there. When they're gone, when we're gone from that, we lose all that. So all that knowledge our children no longer have. And so we have to eventually get back there so we can create new knowledge and new experience to be able to pass that down to our future generations and to have them not become where they're living historically or having to go back to oral histories of what was done 100, 200 years ago, but they become active within their culture to be able to be informants to future generations moving forward. So one of the areas that's a very important place to us is Lalit, or what they call the land above water, or Red Lake Mountain. We have stories within um, our oral history, not only our tribe, but all the other tribes within the plateau area that talks about um, the floods that came forth and about the people running to the top. When you look at Lalik and some of the areas of that mountain stretch, those are areas that most of our roots, you can find them all within those areas and they're very specific. Lalik in general, it has roots on there that one of the roots that grows on there we call looks. It has another root that looks very similar to that, but in that area that we know, the root on that one that looks just like that one is twice the size. The species is, is different, and it only grows in that area. And there's also medicines on top of that mountain that only are within that area because of the certain elevation, the certain soil types, the different specialness of that area. We were always told that when you look at that, that is held sacred by all of our tribes. And it is a spiritual epicenter for us where our young men, they would go up there and have their Wyakins or their visions up there. So it's a place that we don't want a lot of people because of some of the cultural sites that we worry about being disturbed and the importance of that area and how that place is lit up. And it's special because when the first people were here and the people of everything, this is where they came from. And those one roots in particular that are big, they are there because those are the first, they were the first of those foods that came forward and the importance that place has. They say, even like our souls, you know, because of the way the place is lit and because of what that place means coming out of the water, um, how special that place is, that is also a place that when we pass or move forward, that after people pass away, their spirits, when they're ready to leave, it is a place of power that people, their spirit goes to that area and they ascend, they ascend up into the heavens from there. And so when you're looking at a place like that, you see the why we want to protect it and why the integrity of it is so special because of the things that happen there um, and the power that it has energy-wise. And so when we're looking at different places, and even Tri-Cities, it, it is a special place. Um, it might seem dry or desolate to others, but there is a lot of foods and cultural resources that live that are very specific to tribal people and very important within our history. And there's sagebrush that's living there, the old sagebrush stands that don't live anywhere else. So one of the things that's really important to us is looking at the tribal community cultural content 
continuity preservation outreach and education project that we do. When we do this, this is bringing our people back and providing opportunity for us to be able to bring kids out for first foods excursion and outreach into areas in land such as hopefully one day we'll be able to get back onto those sites or onto areas within the reach that are safe. There might have to be when we go out to actually look for areas that we want to gather, we might have to take the foods from there and have them tested first to make sure that they are clean enough for us to be able to eat without harming us. And if it isn't, how can we have um, uh, the people that are managing those areas help clean those so one day they can be? And looking at that mission statement and how we're restoring those um, foods, bringing our people back to those areas, looking for legal access to be able to one day go back to these sites and to have active harvest and to bring our people back so they have that knowledge that they can be able to say, yeah, um, we go gather this there, or this is what we do in this area, and this is why we do it. And we bring out our youth to be able to do this, or, or to those teachings that are done there, because it's very important. One of the things about the importance of access is our within our reservation, you cannot acquire all the food that's underneath that um, first foods list or all the foods that have. Over in the Hanford area, I told there's certain areas in the hills that they once um, documented over 200 different plant native food species that were gathered. To this day, there's about maybe a handful, maybe 14 less, 10 less. And we're working on bringing that knowledge that has been lost because we have been locked out. We have every year, our goal is to learn more of the foods, more learn more of the roots that were once gathered and then be able to either find that knowledge if it's not there and bring that back to our tribal use. And when we bring them out, we can say, okay, we used to gather this one, this one, this one. I want you to gather all of them and then bring them back so they can process them. They can taste them. We can relearn them and get back to what we used to be prior to being removed from some of these areas. We also are being affected by climate change, being locked out of areas. Um, and it's very critical for us that we're starting to form partnerships with um, different landowners, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, um, other land managers, and private land or, um, owners so we can start creating more access and partnerships so we can one day maybe go out and gather from some of those sites. So this is an example of, this is a partnership we have with the Wallawa Land Trust where we go up and we went to this property called the Paul Flanders site. And when we were there, we had never been on there before. And we were looking for certain foods that were important to us. One of the things that we found was that the yellow bell, which also grows within the Hanford area. And in that area, it's plentiful. And because it's kind of sandy, it's easy to grow and it grows bigger over there. Well, in this area also it grows, but what we started noticing is there's certain rooftops that we hadn't seen before that were different. And from some of the elders and the older women that we have talked to is some of these foods within these areas that have been locked have become kind of cross-breaded or hybrid where they're, because they are closed off, they have been changing a little bit over time. There's a lot of information we don't know. So as we continue to go to these areas, we can learn more about our first foods, start doing more documentation and see, is this extinct? Will it help once we get back on there? Because the way we harvest and the way we put the the food top and the seed down we're dropping whole entire seed pods and replanting that is that how we're helping them be more productive while we plant uh, because of how we've been taught to um, harvest to make things more productive this is um this is an example of different things you might find there you probably wouldn't find the the strawberry on that site but the, i know that the new nuts um, this is the mariposa lily that grows there. And this is a key one where there are some areas you don't see a lot of it, but over on those sites within those areas, especially along that rattlesnake and Badger Mountain, is that we have seen these blooms out there, which are really 
beautiful. To, and it'd be nice to be able to bring our tribal membership back there to start harvesting these because there's not a lot of areas that you have blooms that happen, particularly like this one that you see here, because this resource doesn't, it doesn't um, produce in one year. It takes six to seven years for these bulbs to get big enough so they are productive. So when we are gathering, we have to make sure that at the same time we gather, but we are doing it in a way so it's always more productive and we're not over harvesting. Um, because of areas have been locked out, there has been some areas that have been over harvest certain places that they only use specific, they might only gather just for feasts to have feasts for certain areas because we have to look for more areas further than just beyond where we're at or where our, our land, land bases within those ter territories because we have been uh, locked out of so many lands where we used to gather close. And so it, it really is hard for us tribal members to really promote cultural preservation when we're struggling to find places to bring our, our children that haven't been um, overgrazed or turned into wheat fields and um, places because we need these natural landscapes, these scrub lands that have these natural foods that are still growing and that have been untouched. And there's not a lot of them. Um, one of the things that's important as we do start maintaining access to some of these areas we haven't been, it is important for us to start looking at are the species the same? Have they changed? A lot of our species have what's considered male and female species, so you see a difference in change. On this site that we went gathering, um, and this is an example, and this is what you would find over on, on Rattlesnake, and I don't have any update that has some of the roots related to those areas because it's been a few years or actually it's been a long time seven on the side but I know that they have these same species up there but in this area when we regained access we had found that there was a lomation which was uh, considered um, lomadium gormami which was a uh, kind of a dwarf version of one of the foods that we gather and it only gathers with uh, it only grows like in the Wallawa Oregon region and then also the bitterroot that was very distinctive. And we know that when you talk about Lalique or Rattlesnake, there's things that are very specific to those areas too. And so we have these places all over the place that we haven't returned to. And as we're starting to return and create these partnerships, we're able to recome back in connection with these foods that we have been removed from and to relearn them, to bring them back into the knowledge of our children and also into our, our diets. Um, and this one right here is uh, Luisia, Columbia, Narva, <laughs> Wallawanesis. And I imagine within Rattlesnake, you'd have something kind of similar where it might be the name, if it has a name, it would be specific to that area. I remember that when I was up there on that site, that there was a plant probably maybe 20 plus years ago when I was working on that site, there was a plant that they had found that was brand new um, when they were coming across. I think there were some botanists that were working on top of the mountain. And so it's very key to look, you know, what are the resources that are up there? And that is also why we're pretty protective of those areas too. So one of the things that we really did is we really wanted to reconnect to Wapto within the area. And one of the areas that we had to go to is to um, the R Richland area. And we were able to locate um, the Indian potato or Wapto. And so when we went out there, we had to relearn how to gather it. We had to learn how to dig it, how to regather it. And then from there, we had it tested. We brought it home and also gave it to our native plant nursery. We gave it to our environmental science so they could test it to see if it's safe. And also to plant it, to do some testing to see, is it easy to plant? Is it easy to propagate? So we can take some of it and start relocating it areas here at home because it was eradicated 100 years ago when they were coming in to push a lot of tribes onto the reservations, they were burning out some of these um, 
areas where the Wapto was. And not only that, when the dams came in, the dams had flooded multiple areas where our Wapto did grow. And so now you can find different pockets of it, but it's not like it used to. So we're coming reconnected to this and bringing this back into the knowledge of our youth to be able to talk about it. And it's very high in potassium and it has very specific high iron certain um, vitamins that help with your energy production, help with weight loss, help with your eyes. And it has a lot of things related to um, phosphorus, potassium, vitamin B, complex iron, copper. It was a food that they gathered in the late fall and winter. And it sounds key because when you're looking at what they needed to get through the winter, this was the resource. They would take it and cook it on open coal fires. They would boil, steam it. We would pound it into flour. They'd make it into cakes. They'd serve it as bread. They did a lot of things with this one resource. One of the things that are impacting our first foods today is the climate change. It has become so hot at certain times of year that salmon in the Columbian Snake Rivers, once the temperature gets 71 degrees, they start dying. In 2015 and 2020, in the last few years, we have been seeing over a half million sockeye or different fish dying within our rivers. This image that you see of um, the salmon up here at the top, this was from last year of them coming through the Bonneville Dam. This is them hitting the Bonneville Dam. It was so hot that their flesh was literally sliding off their body and they weren't even halfway here yet and not even close to the tributaries from how far they had to come. And now they're getting, you know, knocked out by the sea lions at the front of the, the um, ocean because they have to acclimate for about um, two to two weeks to three weeks, if not more, um, from salt water to fresh water before they hit that um, stream to come back up. And so you have a lot of different things that are affecting them, not only just climate, but what's happening with the, the other animals that are kind of out of tilt. And you have the the eels that are sensitive to that too, also um, the mussels. And that affects our fishermen that are out there fishing and trying to, because they do have the ability to sell because we always had that economic source from time immemorial, the ones that do do that, you know, that affects them. And also a lot of them are fishing for their families for subsistence throughout the year too. So that affects their ability to be able to do that. Um, some of the examples for the extreme heat is you don't only see it just in the rivers or sea die-offs, you're also seeing it in cultural resources. So in this resource that we were digging the cedar root right here, and you see where my hand is, there's this area where it kind of comes in. Well, um, our teacher, Mona, she was saying that the year that the salmon bellied up in the river, she said this is when she noticed that the cedar has this brown in between the cedar roots. This is the roots of the cedar. She said it became so hot that the heat penetrated all the way through the ground into the cedar and the cedar roots were actually dying from the cedar trees. And so she was able to address and be able to tell you, this is why this root was dying because it was the same year the salmon bellied up. So we have our cultural teachers that have knowledge and they relate it to what they gather and where they're seeing that. Um, and so it's important that we're looking at not only just the food, but how does it relate to the, the cultural aspects of the resources that we're gathering too. We also seen that the last few years we've had um, the animals and people getting sick from how hot the, the Columbia has become in the Tri-Cities area alone. Um, there's that dog that they had on the news. His name was Charlie. He was playing on the shores of the Columbia River north of Richland. And after he was in the water, several hours later, he died. And he wasn't the only one. There were several animals that became sick also. And there were some people that became sick. And what they had found is that the water was so hot, it was creating these toxic algae that was found in slow moving water um, with elevated nutrients that was coming from the fertilizers. Um, the record heat and widespread drought played a big part in that and, and how, because of Columbia is more, um, it, it normally used to be a fast flowing river 
with small tributaries and and it's not like that no more it's more of like a dam system so how are we going to look at um maintaining that how are we going to fix that in the future um i was really disturbed by this because usually during this time of the year we would be on the rivers fishing in the rivers and my daughter when they're fishing in the columbia um, she'd be playing in the river waiting as they're bringing the salmon back in and they'd be swimming in these areas. And so when you're looking at the quality of water, you know, you have kids that are in there swimming and playing in this and it affects all of us, not only us because they're cultural resources, but the Tri-Cities area and the people that are doing recreation there are even wanting to fish there. What's becoming of them? When we're looking at this, you know, I, I like to kind of look at the relationship is for us women. Women have a natural bond with water because we are both life bearers and we carry babies in internal ponds within ourselves. When they came forth into the world, they came forth as water or through a wave when they're coming through. As people and women and all of us, it is our responsibility to safeguard the water for all future generations, not only for tribal people, not only for tribes, but also for the people that are living there currently today and how we're going to interact with that. And the agencies that are supposed to be cleaning these areas up to make them safe for all of us. We are also affected by smoke within the areas that affects every single one of us. This is an example from 2020 when we had those really big um, fires that were happening. And this is the Columbia Gorge where you see this smoke plume that's coming all through. This affected our ability to go harvest salmon, meat, roots, and huckleberries. Me, I wasn't able to bring my daughter out because me and her have very sensitive lungs. And so I had to keep her indoors with multiple um air filters and different things but my partner at the time he was fishing on the columbia river and they were living in tents so for all that whole entire month of that all those fires they were in those tents the whole entire time when i would go see them their eyes would be burning them their lungs would be burning them because when the nets are out in the river and that smoke came and they had 30 nets out there. They had no ability to get out of that. So they were out there on the river fishing. And this is a picture of the bow of the boat. And on the Nichiwana, you know, the smoke inundated the whole entire place and the practices that were going on by tribal treaty fishermen and other fishermen that might have been out there or could have been out there um, doing sports fishermen. But because the smoke was so bad, a lot of them were out in the area. So in this area right here, you can actually see the bow of the boat. They said on some days you can even see the crew from one side of the boat to the other side of the boat. And it was so dangerous when they were trying to get their nets out because the fish were in them that the barges were going through until they shut them down. And we're always told that when the fish is there, you're there. When the roots are there, you're there. You don't have luxury to set back because you're providing for your people. When we're looking at climate change, the Umatel Confederate Tribes has really worked hard to create our new um, climate change policy. And within that, we really wanted to bring it back home to us. How does a policy look and work for the Umatel Confederate Tribes? And that's easy. That is making sure that the climate is the climate change policy related to the first foods and the importance of those, the importance of water, surface groundwater, looking at first foods availability and access, looking at infrastructure of our own buildings and the safety of those, how that relates to the human health and happiness of our tribal members and us being able to gather those things, the economy and the community. And with that economy and the growth, are we able to make sure that we're not hurting resources as we grow and do we have enough water and everything to support that how are we going to protect those things and work that looking at the energy production use and what are of our what are sovereign rights and the treaty rights to help us protect and how are we going to do that so we created um a climate policy that reflects and that's built around the first foods and how that looks for us to move forward into the future one of the work that I do within the area of Tri-Cities is I do public outreach and education. I have in the last year and over the years, 
We do different work related to the Salmon Summit. I do school programs within the area where I provide first foods programming um, that talks about the cultural importance of us on that landscape. I work with, I'm currently I'm working with um, a Hanford working group. They're having uh, a Hanford uh, summer youth camp where we'll be in the area and doing tours on the Hanford Reservation, working with the Wanapum. Um, doing an event over there for this young group that's coming in and doing many things within the area and the Hanford area. I have worked with LIGO as a tribal consultant to help with when they were building their museum over there and also providing first foods presentations and working with them for several years during the pandemic when everything was shut down on how we were going to do things. We also do projects um, to help assess when the cultural resources is called in when there's doing some type of building or they're doing things related along the waterways um, that might affect um, different sites or high density areas that are considered um, high density for village areas or how they have to protect things or archaeology's work in those to help protect and maintain and work through the different processes. They have all different processes that they um, have throughout there that I'm not well versed in, but one day we could have somebody do a presentation related to even cultural resources, technical work that they do with all the working groups. Um, but how do we protect those cultural sites that are along those riverscapes if they um, do do any type of building or work on the boat ramps or if we want to do vegetation plantings? Are we able to do it? Is the area too sensitive that we can't even do outreach planting there? So looking at how do we work with those areas? Um, we've done presentations with the Washington State University over in the Richland, um, presentations for the Audubon Society, Department of Energy. Um, we do a lot of trainings during employee um, month during Native American month. So we do a, a lot of request, requests that come up. I've also worked with the STEM program over in Richland for the at the community library, which I actually I like those. So those are pretty fun. This picture that you see here is actually me doing um, an outreach event at the auto barn where we did a presentation. I also had um, some plant resources from actually the Tri-Cities area that I really wanted to talk about the importance and that they came from that home. We're really striving to preserve our culture, to bring our people back to, to the areas. Um, this right here, this is one of our tribal members that we are gathering the uh, Indian Wapato there, which is very key down there. Um, and to be able to bring our people back to the area and restore knowledge that has been lost and removed from us. Our food has always been resilient, even though everything that happens in climate change, sometimes it just moves. Sometimes that you don't see a resource like in and Wapato, one example was in the Yakima area. Um, the Yakima tribe was working for years to um, turn the area that was dewatered and to put it back into trust and to be able to um, put the water back into that landscape and create the wetlands that historically it used to be. So once they finally um, worked that out and they returned the water, one of their goals was for the next year for them to get some seed and to start to try to re-plant um, the Indian potato, the wapto, the arrow leaf plant, back into that homeland because that's where it used to be found. One of its um, one of their oral histories that talks about that was the area where they used to gather. So that was a goal that they were going to work for it. Well, come the next year when they went back out to the site, they see this plant. And lo and behold, once they return the water back to that area after 80 plus years, the Wapto naturally came back. The seed was within the soil. And so sometimes just restoring areas back to their natural state, you will see those first foods coming back. They are very resilient and sometimes they're, they just need a little help to get there. We are a food associated culture. So our food relates to our ability to be able to access, to harvest, to prepare it, 
to be able to teach there, but we need access to those lands to be able to do that related to some foods that only grow in certain areas to be able to share that with their tribal member and also to educate others. It's very important for our tribe um, that we, we, our board of trustees said, we want you to go out and educate and partner. We can either step back and not do any of that, or we can go forward and try to work together to reclaim our culture and reclaim things. And we know that sometimes there's a tipping and, and sometimes we have to create um, a cultural memorandums of agreement or we have to do things related to cultural sensitivity where the knowledge is only for the tribe but how can we do that in a good way and move forward and so the ability to also celebrate those foods when we bring them back home our food is protected by the treaty rights and this is kind of how they link up you have the water rights for the water fishing rights for fish hunting rights for the deer you're gathering grazing rights, protecting these foods. They have to be sustainable, safe to eat. They're protected by these treaty rights and by the work that we're doing to protect and manage them because the tribes are co-managers within those areas, especially up into the Hanford and tri -Cities. We have memorandums agreement as co-managers of those resources within the Hanford, along the waterways, the Columbia, Pasco, Richland, we have agreements with all of them of, of us working together because we all have vested um, interest within those areas. And that's because the cultural rights, the, the cultural sensitivity and our historic, um, the his, historic uh, and passed down knowledge that we have of us always being in that area and the other tribes our sister tribes and our brother tribes that are there living in those areas and how we need to work together to help protect those two. So one of the things I'd like to leave you with the food for thought is that the struggle is not yet ended. Deeds of such magnitude cannot be undone or over with as many of you believe or what can be there. They cannot stand alone in a period of time their tentacles reach out to oncoming generations and touch the lives of our people. We live centuries after the deeds themselves seem only echoes in history. And this was said by Maude Antone, who was at that time in 1955, our board of trustees chairwoman. And when you're looking at the Hanford site, that is so true by things that have happened from other generations. And we're working to clean up their mess. And how can we work and create partnerships, and also be compliant year after year as co-managers now, then, and therefore, and working forward that. Thank you, and I hope that you were able to get some information that works for you, and um, now we can open up for questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Wynax. That was a really amazing presentation, and thank you again for your time. Uh, we did get a couple of questions on the Facebook. But before we get into that, um, I just want, just want to remind folks that feel free to put your your questions into the chat on Facebook or the chat or the Q and A um, boxes on Zoom. And if you also want to just uh, you know turn on your camera and unmute and ask your question if you're on the Zoom version, feel free just to raise your hand and we'll call on you. And I will uh, I'll uh, I'll let I'll change the permissions to allow that. Uh, but to start us off with, let's go ahead and go over to Facebook. When next we had a question from Susan Luckband, and Susan asked. Are the tribes planning to try and create a kind of planting slash farming operation on respective reservations to grow some of the first foods to ensure future availability? <laughs> um, right now our stance is, <clears throat> or the, from what I'm aware of, they've been talking about certain things of this, but for the, for the Umatil Confederated Tribes at this time, we're working that because we have the Department of Natural Resources mission is to restore and enhance the natural habitats of those foods across the landscape naturally because these foods, they don't, the roots, they don't turn over in a year. They don't turn over in a year like, um, a garden does. They take several years. We need to make sure that we're restoring natural landscapes to bring them back in um, in, in such a, a 
big areas. So we have the ability to go from one side to other, but restoring whole landscapes um, in the sense that there is some areas where you find that there is not a lot of the first foods where we might have been talking about doing seed collections of some of the critical plants and be able to take the seeds and replanting them in vegetation areas that are critical. There are areas that we can't find as many choke cherries. So we're like, can we have you guys start planting choke cherries in stretches of um, habitat areas? So because a lot of choke cherries that grow along our areas want to grow right along the road. But the thing that's bad about that is sometimes they're spraying pesticides on them. And so that doesn't make it safe for us to be able to harvest and eat, but we can't find them like along outside of the river. Or I've looked where my job is to go search for them to bring people out to, and they like the road. They like it where people spray. And so like, where can we find space? So we're like, okay, well, let's ask um, our fisheries to maybe we, they plant some more extra um, choke cherries or area, in areas, or they can let us know that we planted all these choke cherries or all these currants, all these service berries along this way. And so once we find out where they're planting, we can go in to be able to harvest from those areas. There are things within our native plant nursery that they do grow for, uh, specifically for habitat projects. I know that there has been discussions of if they do go into that, like how would that look? But like I said, our first foods, they don't turn over like a typical um, what you find in the garden. And a lot and a lot of things that you find in the garden, they have been scientifically modified to be faster, to grow quicker. And we do not want to do that with our plants, with our first foods. We want them to grow naturally. Also, you if we grew them in a garden like environment we lose the access to be able to teach culture how culture is meant to be teached out on those sites in those areas so we want to make, make sure that we're just repairing the whole ecological processes of their land areas to bring us back out to those areas not only for us but for everybody but fixing those processes that have been broken down awesome thank you and honor Grisel, i think you're next yeah, I do uh, have a comment saying thank you so much, Renex, for this presentation. And I have a question. Can you put contact information up again for a moment? So maybe people that want to be able to contact you again. So if you yep. can put that on the presentation, that would be awesome. And then do you have um, more questions, Ryan? Yeah, I have one more, but I'll wait a second for my next the slide up. Okay, oh, and then I have a couple more. You can go ahead. I, okay. I can. okay, awesome. So this question is also on Facebook and it comes from uh, Ginger actually, uh, which she was an outreach event, so she can't join us tonight. And she just got back late, but Ginger's question was, uh, is the tribe using clams or mussels and which river are they able to harvest them? We have not been able to have any harvest in any river that I know of. We're currently, have the um, wet lab over in Walla Walla where we're actually raising and propagating and we're the only place um, with on this part of the continental divide that is raising in this way for the Pacific. Um, there's only three other labs I think in the world that are raising the ones that we're raising specifically. Um, so last year they actually I think implanted over a half a million which it took them 10 years to get to that place we've had a lot of trial and error because nobody is actually doing this work um so so far no we have not been able to do any harvest and the mussel beds and things that are there are in the rivers um in some cases, we found little small beds of them that were doing okay, but in the last few years when they have returned to certain sites, some of those beds are dying, and they don't know exactly what the reason why. It's probably for temperature rises, and maybe not only that, maybe anything else that's going into the waterway that might be running off from the uplands or from um, irrigation. So they are in critical state, but we are working really hard to 
do restoration work to try to bring them back because they are cleaners of the river like the lamprey are to the juveniles they they clean those areas and they clean um hundreds of thousands if not millions of gallons i think because some mussels if they're in a healthy waterscape they can live 150 years they can live a long long time if the water is cold and clean enough and healthy and they also have you know and, and you need fish there too to be able specific fish so you have some mussels that when they go and go up into the water they hook to certain gills of certain fish you have some that are only want to be paired up with um salmon or even a certain specific salmon and then you have some of them that it doesn't matter they'll go to anything and so they're very critical to the species that they need to be able to connect to the gills and then once they're connected that they travel with the fish and then they grow and then they drop off and then they're able to redisperse into different substrates at different places so we're really working hard on bringing those ones back we would hope to one day get to the place that we can harvest within our river systems that's the goal thank you winnix we have the next question is the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation involved in ecological restoration of areas at Hanford or involved in decision-making about how areas should be ecologically yes. restored with native plants? All those, yes. When, for example, when I was about 17, 18 years old, I worked with the Salmon Corps and during that time, there were certain areas and things that happened on the Hanford Reservation. In some cases, burials getting uncovered or different sites that come and build and we, um, they'd have the tribes and we would go there and have to go out, um, find different species from different places across the Hanford Reservation and also grow. We also had seed collection where we'd go back out to those sites and do um, restore those sites that were either uncovered or destroyed or bringing some of those plants back from those areas, um, bringing them back to those areas like the Emsil area, some of the um, ha Hanford sites out there that have some of the buildings that we did some restoration work and replanting their native vegetation that was there on the site they still do a lot of um the i think they do weed ratification out in those areas um but that was even when i was 17 to 18 tribe has been doing stuff since you know from from the beginning i think pretty early on of working with hanford and we have always been within at the table within those working groups um because of the sensitivity that we have related to those and making sure that Hanford uh, Department of Energy and those other um, people that manage those areas are all also in compliance and taking care of what they're supposed to be doing to clean up those areas. Awesome, thank you. I hope that answered that. Uh, I think you did. Uh, we we do have uh, one more question that came out on Facebook, and this question um, comes from. And actually, first, I want to say you did get a lot of comments that came out on Facebook that just thanked you for your presentation and and for your time tonight. Uh, one of them was, you know, really great talk. Grateful for you sharing your knowledge and passion. I'm supportive of your work. Um, another one was, thank you. It's great to hear about the important work of the tribe and, and just, just similar comments. I just want to make sure that you knew that you're getting some, some comments there. And the last question we have for now on Facebook comes from uh, uh, Kristen and Kristen asks, how do native children get connected to education opportunities? Well, um, I think when you're looking at native American children that wherever they are, there's, for us, you know, we have on the reservation, um, we have a lot of different programs that are happening that you can go to different, um, the tribes, web page you can go to the yellow hawk web page you can look at calendars all tribes have different type of community boards or community things that show the different um and not only that we have facebook sites too and all the tribes have different facebook sites and it depends who who the tribal student or the tribal person is or if they're in some of the cities like um portland 
or even in Tri-Cities areas, I imagine there's some type of program that might be happening within those areas. Sometimes um, last winter we were brought in for to the REACH uh, Museum and we did some outreach there for a whole day where we um, we they did some dancing, some presentations, we had booths. Um, but the tribes right now have those calendars. You can go out to their websites. You can go to Facebook, look up whatever tribe it is you're closest to and to find what's going on within their communities. Um, our Yellow Hawk Health Center, they always have on site, they have like a monthly page that shows this is what they're doing every month. You can sign up. You have to call to sign up or um, our family prevention, they open that up. So people that want to do things on Wednesday nights or Friday nights at a certain time. They do women's groups, men's groups for health and behavior. Um, like last night, they were doing a, a fishnet. Um, I think they've been doing a fishnet making class that they've been going on for weeks that, that people had to sign up for. So it just depends where you're at um, and, and looking at some of those community boards or reaching out to the Native American groups if you're in the city looking to see for example if tri-cities had a native american groups i know they have native american aces over there there's different groups that you can look in to see what is available within those areas and over there yakima heritage heritage center i imagine you can look at the heritage center because it's closer to tri-cities if you have native students over there to see what what's going on within that area those are some really great resources. Thank you for sharing. And I think uh, Andre Sala has just one question left. Yes, I do. The question is, is there any kind of map of specific sections of land that you don't currently have access to and or that needs to be restored to its previous natural states? I know that we have map upon map, of, but I don't know, I don't, well, when we look at a map, you can instantly look at a map and see what's open lands, what's BLM lands, what's closed lands. And so you can look at maps like that and find out what that area is. I mean, you could look at Tri-Cities and we know for sure Hanford's closed. Rattlesnake's closed. Some of those things are closed. And so when we know there's areas that are particular to us, we have our programs that will reach out for access directly. Um when as tribal members, when you go out, a lot of them are downloading like hunters apps or different apps that it'll open up. And as you're moving through, the app will show you this is this landowner, this is that landowner, this is forest surf, this is BLM to also help protect our tribal members too. That when they're hunting, they have to make sure that they are following laws too. We do have our own policies and procedures to help govern our own people because sometimes they do what's not right too but also it's our job too to help educate our our tribal um membership to help them how do they read a map how do they look at the map you know where's those lines and it is not the easiest thing on those maps because having to look at that but uh, a, a lot of the maps you can get we go to the Forest Service directly to their office and say, okay, we're going to go to Ukiah. Do you have a Forest Service map that shows all the areas? And on there, it'll have the break. It'll say this road right here, road 224, whatever. And so we're like, oh, we know that's Forest Service. We can take that road all the way out. So we, we have to be very, um, we're working on creating maps that are specific to for tribal members, hopefully one day when we acquire enough resources to help us, but to start tracking areas where we can find availability for foods and places that they can go to. Um, our tribe currently this last about four years, we've been working with the Wallawa Land Trust over in Wallawa, Oregon, where they have opened up areas to the reserve so we can go out and harvest. But we also been doing public presentations within the area 
asking landowners if they would be willing to let us go out to assess their areas, maybe educate them a little bit to see, would they give us access to be able to go harvest on there? And in the last few years, we've been very successful and we have over 20 plus and growing. We went from probably about 5,000 acres to over 700 and 70,000 acres of us to be able to um, access to go do some of these harvesting. But, you know, at the same time, in some places we have um, agreements with them or with landowners where we uh, will sign a contract to make everybody that we're going out that, you know, we're going in in a respectful way, we're picking up after ourselves. And so how can we create partnerships with some landowners? Others are just like, yeah, you can go ahead and go. Or you can, it's okay if you go ahead and cross our fence and you can gather all you want, young lady. And and it's good to see you guys back out here because my grandmother and grandpa used to talk about your people bringing your whole, you know, your teepees, you set up village and they said you guys were always here. And so we, and then we have people that they still shoot at us, literally, you know, within the last few years, I had um, a, a family saying that uh, a man was shooting at her kids because they were crossing the river. What he doesn't, he, they were in the river, but that right of exclusive taking fish, there's a clause within there. Tribal people can be in the river. It doesn't matter where the river goes. They can be in the river because of those treaty rights, the way it's written, they can be in the river to the flood blank on either side fishing, as long as they don't cross over. But us as tribal members, we also know that they're that can be very tricky. And so a lot of us, if we want to cross to get access, we'll go and, and and some people will like go and ask the landowner that we are going to be fishing. We're coming across to, you know, we do have some treaty rights and a lot of people don't know all of those rights. And so it's our job to also educate too. Um, and sometimes they'll be like, well, if we catch something, we catch two, you know, we can give you one. And, you know, sometimes they create partnerships with the landowners and and some of them have created really close bonds with some of the landowners where their families have been friends for years and years and years, or they're creating, or right now we're creating new ones. Thank you so much. Um, so with that, I don't see any other uh, questions in either of our chats. So we'll go ahead and go to um, the closing part of the night. Uh, I want to thank everybody that attended tonight and for, for the great questions that, that were asked. And again, to, to give a huge thank you to Wenex for her time. Um, and Anna Grisel will just cover a few things of where to find the recording and then and then I can close this out for the night. Anna Grisel. Yeah, I just wanted to share, we got a comment from Chelsea. Thank you very much for your presentation. This has been extremely illuminating. So that's awesome. And then thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna remind our attendees that this event was recorded and it will be up shortly on both our Ecology Facebook and the Ecology YouTube channel. We will also add this recording link to our website and that website is ecology.wa.gov. Back to you, Ryan. Awesome, thank you. Um, before we close out, I, went next, I just wanna see if you had any final thoughts or remarks that you wanted to share. Um, not that I can think of it at the moment other than it, the work is big, especially when it comes to Hanford and especially when it comes to those areas. And there's places there that, I mean, on the reserve alone, that that it is one of the most contaminated places in the U.S. One of the most contaminated places in the, in the U.S. And in that, you know, we one day we would hope that it becomes clean enough that we are able to return to those places safely. And that is the goal, not only for us, but for everybody that's living there, because we all have an interest because whatever flows into the water flows down the river and our fish and, and everything get in it. So it, it kind of takes all of us to, 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 I think, be aware. And then also, you know, in some cases, sometimes we have to be vocal to that, you know, we are making sure that others are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, the tribe does a lot of work with that. And there's days where I see my co-work workers just, they come out of there and they've been doing Hanford topics all day in meetings and they're so drained. 
because the issues are so big and sometimes everybody's not, you know, meeting in the same page. And so they feel like it, it's just a lot of work to get there where some people don't want to be compliant or, or they, you know, and we're only moving forward because our board of trustees tell us this is the work you have to do. This is, you have to be part of this. And it takes a lot and it takes time because you're working with tribes too. Some things take longer. They, they just don't move quick because we're all working to comply. And then once we figure out what's going on, we have to go back to our director's to report and they got to go to the board of trustees report and then they got to tell us what to do and come back they got to go to the lawyers and so there's just a, a lot of working components so sometimes things move slower than they could or at the same time sometimes we slow processes down because in their plan they were moving so fast to just put it on the bundle and we're like you got to break that out further how are you going to get there what are those steps are going to be how are you going to be compliant and so making sure that that we're not rushing to create a plan, but we're creating a plan that is successful from now, 10 years, 50 to 100, to, to long-term. And so we're really working to make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. So well, with that, thank you again so much for joining tonight. It was so great to have you. And to everybody else, stay tuned for future events. Um, we'll do another blog announcement similar to our uh, future one, which will likely be um, uh, fall time, roughly. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and close out for the night. And thank you, everybody, so much for attending tonight.